Well, you know, it's not really that difficult uh, to find people today, particularly in this country, uh, and especially in this part of the country, who say they believe in God, right? In fact, it, uh, it's actually quite common for people around our neck of the woods to profess some kind of faith or some kind of belief in God, and I mean in the Christian God, in, in Jesus Christ, which uh, I think what is far more difficult um, to find, however, are people who actually, who actually have that God at the center of their lives because we live in a culture that offers us so many other God, so many other things that we can focus on instead of Jesus Christ. Of course, I don't think we necessarily uh, always think about money um, or career or sex or family or addictions or uh, hobbies or material things as gods, right? And yet, that's exactly what those things become the moment they take the place of Jesus Christ at the center of our lives. In fact, we are, every single one of us, ruled by something. We all bow to something in our lives, whether we're willing to admit that or not doesn't change the fact that we all bow to something. We all have something that, that drives us, that motivates us, that inspires us, that captivates us, and most of all, something that demands our focus above everything else. And whatever that is, Whatever is truly at the center of our lives, if it is anything other than Jesus Christ, then we've actually made that other person or that other thing our God because it occupies a place in our lives that should be reserved for Jesus Christ alone. Okay, there's a, there's a throne, metaphorically of course, at the center of every single person's life and whoever or whatever is on that throne is what rules us. So one of the most effective lies ever perpetrated against God's people throughout history has been this idea that as long as we believe in God, that means He is our God. Yet Scripture's very clear that you can believe in God without Him actually being your God, right? And one of the most well-known examples in the Bible, James, the brother of Jesus, said, you believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder, James 2.19. And, you know, actually James was pointing there back to the Shema in De uh, Deuteronomy 6.4, which was a Jewish creed about the importance of monotheism, the belief that there's only one God, as opposed to the Canaanites, uh, who, of course, were polytheistic. They believed there were many gods. The point being, James was saying, listen, you can have an intellectual assent about the Christian faith. You can believe that there's only one God and, and even believe that that God is Jesus Christ, which, of course, is good. But you understand, the demons believe that, too. So obviously believing that Jesus Christ is God and Jesus Christ actually being your God are two altogether different realities. And so there are other religions today, of course, that accept Jesus Christ as a God, one of many, so they worship him alongside many others. And yet there are also people right here at home who profess to be, you know, monotheistic, the Christians, people who believe that there's only one God and believe that that God is Jesus Christ, and yet they actually chase after many other gods in their lives because they've been led to believe, in many cases by the church, that as long as you accept that Jesus Christ is God as the truth, then He is your God. While in fact, Scripture points out from one end of this book to the other, that believing God is who He says He is and Him actually being your God are two very different things. In fact, it all comes down to who or what is at the center of your life. Because yes, of course, there has to be, there has to be a mental ascent, an understanding, certainly, and a conviction, a belief, yes, that Jesus Christ is the one true God, but Him actually being your God well, that also means that you give your very life to Him in repentance and faith. You, you worship and follow Him to the exclusion of worshiping and following all of those other things. Which doesn't mean uh, we don't have some of those other things in our lives necessarily. It just means that those things are not at the center of our lives. 
because that place is reserved for God alone. And honestly, I think, I think this is the far greater challenge facing the church today than there simply being a lack of professing believers in our modern culture. We hear all the time about there being less and less people professing to believe in Christ. I think the much larger problem for the church today is the sheer volume of people in our churches who profess to believe in Jesus Christ but refuse to allow him to occupy the throne that is at the center of their lives. So they believe in Jesus, but they actually bow to something else. And I say that in part, at least, because over the last 25 years in ministry, I've dealt with a lot of professing believers who have uh, done things like entered into adulterous relationships or people who refuse to contribute their time or their money to the church or people who chase after material possessions while ignoring the needs of others around them or, or people who pursue their careers at the expense of their families and yet I have never heard one of those professing believers. When I asked them about their faith in Christ, I have never had even one of them ever say to me, the reason that I don't give to the church or the reason I'm pursuing this adulterous relationship or this material addiction or this career move, the reason is because I don't believe in Jesus anymore. No. In every single case, they continued to profess their faith in Christ while openly and consciously choosing to pursue paths in life which are undeniably not the will of God. And that's just it, you see. People usually don't reject their belief in Christ when they follow other gods or put other things at the center of their lives because we think as long as we just believe in Jesus, then in the end it will all work itself out and we'll be okay, which isn't, uh, that's not a new phenomenon, by the way. This has actually been going on throughout human history. And as we'll see, nothing less was at stake for God's people all the way back in the days of Joshua, which he recognized. Joshua could see the same human nature in God's people then that we find in God's people today. And so in our story today, as we continue our sermon series, working our way through the book of Joshua, we find Joshua at the end of his life warning God's people about the dangers of chasing after other gods while trying to include in the mix of their life the God of Israel as a part of their lives. And so he gives them some very clear instructions of how to make sure that Yahweh, the one true God, stays in the very center of their lives. Because when, when we begin to treat God as a part of our lives, instead of the very center of our lives, I'm telling you only bad things happen. We miss out on everything that could have been, everything that we could have been and done and experienced had we simply kept God at the center of our lives. So we're going to pick up the story where we left off last week and see what we can learn from Joshua that may help us understand what it truly means to have God at the center of your life. Okay, we'll start at Joshua chapter 23, and we'll read the first three verses. A long time afterwards, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies, and Joshua was old and well advanced in years, Joshua summoned all Israel, its elders and heads, its judges and officers, and said to them, I am now old and well advanced in years, and you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake, for it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. So the chapter starts out with a long time afterward when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies, which is to say a long time after the Israelites completed their conquest against the Canaanites. In total, this is probably about 25 years or so after the fighting in Canaan had ended, assuming that uh, Joshua and Caleb were about the same age. All right, we know from uh, Joshua 14.7 that Caleb was 40 years old, when Moses sent him and Joshua and the others to spy out the land. And according to Deuteronomy 2.14, from that time until they entered Canaan was another 38 years. So that means Caleb was 78 years old uh, at the beginning of the conquest of Canaan. And we know from Joshua 24 that Joshua is 110 years old when he died 
shortly after this meeting we're reading about today in chapter 23. And so again, if Joshua was the same age or around the same age as Caleb, you subtract the 78 from the 110, then this chapter is happening about 32 years after they first entered Canaan. And then if you subtract the seven years they spent at war with the Canaanites from the 32 years they were in Canaan in total, that means Israel has been at rest from war for the last 25 years as this chapter opens up. That's your math lesson for today. Uh, and it happens to be the fulfillment, by the way, of a promise that was made to God's people in several places in uh, Deuteronomy, including chapter 3, verse 20, chapter 12, verse 10, uh, also in chapter 25, verse 19, that they would have rest in the land of promise. So all that is good. And knowing that, of course, Joshua, nearing the end of his time here on earth, he calls for the leaders of Israel. These were the men who had fought with him, who had bled with him, who had suffered loss with him. These are men who had faithfully followed him into many great victories, and because of it, they've now spent the past quarter of a century enjoying the land, peace, prosperity, without fear of anyone coming against them. So you'd better believe when Joshua calls for them, they were eager to sit with their leader one last time to hear what he had to say. And so he begins by reminding them of all that God has done for them, of all the promises that he'd fulfilled already in their lives. Last week we talked about the importance of doing that very thing for one another today, often remembering what God has done for us because it encourages us, and it builds our faith, and it strengthens our resolve to continue serving God no matter what comes our way. And that's what Joshua is doing here. He's reminding them of all that God had already done for them, at least in part, in preparation for what is coming next. Let's keep reading then, verses 4 and 5. Behold, I've allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes those nations that remain, along with all the nations that I have already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. The Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight. You shall possess their land just as the Lord God, your God, has promised you. So just as the first three verses uh, are Joshua reminding the leaders of Israel of all that God has already done for them, the next two verses are Joshua reminding them of all that God is going to do for them in the future. He's reminding them of the promises of God in their lives that have yet to be fulfilled, okay? God promised his people an inheritance from the River Jordan all the way to the Mediterranean Sea, but Israel has yet to fully occupy that entire territory. So Joshua is making sure they understand that, first of all, it is God alone who makes the promise and gives the victory. And yet, as we'll see in a moment, the responsibility for actually possessing that promise, laying claim to that victory, well, that rests squarely on the willingness of his people to keep God at the center of their lives. You see, there was a, a clause attached to the promise. And yet none of this is new revelation. This is simply Joshua reiterating to them exactly what God's word has always said about their lives and their future. And I find it interesting that Joshua's greatest concern as an old man at the end of his life was the very same concern he had as a young man earlier in his life when he was sent to spy out the land under Moses. Because Joshua wanted more than anything for God's people to take possession of everything that God had promised them. And it was still so important to Joshua at this point, at the end of his life, that the Israelites understood exactly what it was going to take in order for the promise to be completely fulfilled in their lives, that he crafts an entire sermon around it just before he dies, which is what he's presenting to them now through the rest of the chapter. So let's keep reading verses 6 and 7. Therefore be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right hand or to the left, that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you, or make mention of the names of their gods, or swear by them, or serve them, or bow down to them. So right after reminding them of the promise of God, Joshua immediately says, therefore. In other words, 
Now that I've told you what God is going to do, here's what you have to do. Joshua says, you can't mix with these nations remaining among you or make mention of the names of their gods or swear by them or serve them or bow down to them. The Canaanites, they were known <clears throat> for their fertility worship and rituals, which were powerfully attractive to the Israelites. And so Joshua says, in order to keep yourselves from bowing to these other gods, you're going to have to be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right hand or to the left. In other words, keep the word of God in the center of your life. Don't turn away from it to the right hand or to the left. Keep it in the center. Stay focused on his word. Joshua is reminding the Israelites of something they've been told many times before. Keeping God at the center of your life means keeping his word. And as we'll see once we get into the book of Judges later on and beyond, there's zero chance that Israel keeps God at the center of their lives when they fail to keep his word. And there is zero chance that his promises get fulfilled in their lives the way they could have when they fail to keep his word. So please hear me. Church of America in 2018. There is zero chance of you keeping God at the center of your life if you fail to keep his word. And there is zero chance of you seeing his promises fulfilled in your life the way they could be if you fail to keep his word. You see, this book, these holy scriptures, they were exhaled by the Holy Spirit. Think about that. The very same spirit who hovered over the face of the waters when the earth was created in Genesis 1. The very same spirit who enabled Joseph to interpret the dreams of the king of Egypt in Genesis 41 and then gave him the wisdom that saved an entire nation from a great famine in Genesis 47. That very same spirit the very same spirit who filled Samson with the power to kill a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey in Judges 15. The very same spirit who filled Saul with the power to kill his enemies with the yoke of an ox in 1 Samuel 11. The very same spirit who gave Daniel the wisdom to interpret the dreams of the king of Babylon in Daniel 2. The very same spirit who descended upon Jesus himself at his baptism in Luke 3. The very same spirit who descended upon those early disciples in the upper room, anointing them to carry out the great commission in Acts 2. That very same spirit has breathed out his word for you and for me. And yet we're too distracted by other things to simply... Open it up and read it. We've allowed other things to occupy the throne at the center of our lives. But do you understand? We have every bit of wisdom available to us by the same spirit that was available to Joseph and to Daniel. We have every bit of anointing available to us by the very same spirit that was available to Jesus and those original disciples. We have every bit of power available to us by the very same spirit that was available to Samson and to Saul. And so he gave us his words. Why? To guide us into all of that. And it's right here in front of us. And he says, here, take this. This is my free gift to you. Keep it at the center of your life. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left. No, keep it in focus right in the center of your life. Yet so many professing believers, we, we allow these other things to occupy that place at the center of our lives. Which is idolatry, by the way. There's no nice way to say it. This warning from Joshua to the Israelites is nothing more than a fundamental command against idolatry. And idolatry is nothing more than anything we allow to reside at the center of our lives other than Jesus Christ. 
So Joshua says, look, to keep that from happening, to keep God at the center of your life, you're going to have to keep his word which isn't complicated at all, but it also isn't easy. You know that, right? That's why Joshua is bringing it all up in the first place, because the Israelites have been sitting pretty for the last 25 years. Peace, comfort, security, prosperity. I mean, come on, Joshua. Why rock the boat? Why stir up the waters now? We're all good here. Joshua says no. Now, where you are right now in your life is good, but it isn't good enough because God created you for more. So get off the couch. Get out of your comfort zone. Let go of your security and relative life of ease and get on with the work that he created you for and called you to. And by the way, there is zero chance of you doing that successfully if you do not keep his word along the way. The truth is, I am grateful beyond words that we live in this country. I am. I love this country and what it provides me. The problem is, sometimes I love this country and what it provides me more than I love God and what he's promised me. Why do we do that? It's because we like where we are. We like our comfort. We like our security. We like our prosperity and relative ease that so often comes along with living in a great place like this. And look, there's nothing inherently wrong at all with being blessed. But the fact is we can love it so much that we allow it to become the focal point of our lives, the center of our lives and then we neglect his word because I think deep down we know that sometimes his word requires us to step away from comfort, to step away from security, and to step away from prosperity and ease and do the hard work of the gospel. It's exactly what Joshua was warning God's people about. It's good to be blessed but don't allow yourself to become so enamored with those blessings in your life that you turn away from God's word and chase after those blessings instead of keeping God at the center. Okay, sometimes keeping God's word means giving away other things to make room for God at the center of your life. Let's keep reading, verses 8 through 10. But you shall cling to the Lord your God, just as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations. And as for you, no man has been able to stand before you to this day. One man of you puts to flight a thousand, since it is the Lord your God who fights for you, just as he promised you. Be very careful, therefore, to love your God, for if you turn back and cling... Uh, the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them so that you associate with them and they with you. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Joshua is reiterating here the fact that every good thing they're experiencing now is only because of what God has done for them. In fact, if you read verse 10 in the, um, in the ancient Hebrew, he's actually repeating the same phrase from verse 3 verbatim, the fact that it is the Lord God who fights for you. And that wasn't because uh, the conquest of Canaan was a pushover either, right? No, Joshua says the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations. However, he also says the job isn't quite finished yet because God has more for you. So don't forget, it was God alone who got you this far. Joshua says, and it's God alone who's going to take you the rest of the way. And so if you truly want to go the rest of the way, that means you're going to have to cling to him because keeping God at the center of your life requires a clinging to him. By the way, when Joshua uses that phrase, cling to the Lord your God, he's not not painting the picture of someone uh, hanging on to the corner of a robe, right? Or, Or the edge of a garment for dear life. No, the word cling in that phrase is actually a very theologically rich 
term and one that the Jewish people would have understood quite well. It's the ancient Hebrew word dabak and it's used all throughout scripture to describe different kinds of nearly inseparable bonds between people and between different kinds of objects. In Genesis um, 2.24, for instance, it refers to the permanent bond, the covenant relationship between a man and his wife. And actually, the ancient Hebraic root of that word cling refers to the process of soldering or welding two pieces of metal together by a blacksmith. It's that permanent, that inseparable bond that is created when the, when the blacksmith or metal worker welds metal to metal. And interestingly, even in the modern Hebrew language, that same root word is the basis today for their word for glue. So you get the idea. When Joshua says, cling to the Lord your God, <laughs> he wasn't merely saying, hey, grab on to the corner of Jesus and try to hold on for dear life. No, not at all. He was saying, permanently attach yourself, bind yourself, weld yourself permanently to God. Otherwise, you'll easily fall away from him to the left or to the right. And so to stay with him, right at the center of your life, you'll need to be permanently bound to God in a covenant relationship. And by the way, uh, this description of us clinging to God by Joshua is the polar opposite of what we refer to today as cultural Christianity or nominal believers, where uh, people who wear the label Christian, they, they consider themselves to be Christians, but their affiliation with Christianity has far more to do with a religious tradition or social status than it does with having an actual relationship with Jesus Christ. And although they may claim to have faith in Jesus, there's little to no real evidence in their lives that they're actually following Jesus, which is the equivalent of what Joshua was trying to prevent among the Israelites because there were still Canaanites living among them. And their culture was very attractive to the Jews. The Canaanites worshipped pagan gods and pagan goddesses of fertility. Temple prostitution was rampant. In fact, in addition to the biblical descriptions of Canaanite culture throughout the Old Testament, uh, we have many different outside sources, including uh, ancient Punic inscriptions from Carthage and ancient Egyptian depictions and Phoenician inscriptions from Turkey as well, and they all describe all of these many different uh, forms of idolatry and adultery, bestiality, incest, homosexuality, even child sacrifice among the Canaanites. And so when the Israelites did fall away from God, it wasn't like they woke up one day and decided to become pagans. No, it was a gradual slide into Canaanite culture that led to their downfall as they slowly integrated the culture around them in with their own, ultimately allowing that culture to become the center of their lives and of their worship. And so instead of influencing the culture around them to the glory of God, they became virtually indistinguishable, culturally speaking, from the Canaanites. They were God-fearers in name only as their lives began to mirror the pagan culture around them. And look, cultural Christianity is nothing more than the modern version of that in the American church today, where popular opinion and what is culturally acceptable actually has more influence in how we live our lives than the very words the Holy Spirit breathed out for us to live by. It's where we try to bend the teachings of Scripture until they line up with our personal preferences, until the culture of the church becomes virtually indistinguishable from the popular culture around us. And all of this, by the way, it all boils down to what is at the center of your life. Okay? Our culture is all about glorifying and gratifying and satisfying self. The message of this culture is to put yourself at the center of your own life. And when the culture and teachings of the church do the very same thing, we're taking our focus off of Christ and putting it back on ourselves. If the primary focus of our teaching in the church becomes health and wealth and prosperity, 
all we're doing is taking our focus off of Christ and putting it back on ourselves. When we view the church as something that primarily exists to serve us rather than something that primarily enables us to serve others, we're taking the focus off of Christ and putting it back on ourselves. When we refuse to allow the church to have any influence or authority in our lives at all, we're taking our focus off of Christ and putting it back on ourselves. When we remove every aspect of the gospel message that is unpopular or difficult to hear so as not to offend anyone, we're taking our focus off of Jesus Christ and we're putting it back on ourselves until eventually you end up with nothing more than a weak, ineffective, impotent, feckless, and quite frankly, useless organization that is powerless to affect change in the culture around it. It has no authority to influence the lives of the members within it and accomplishes nothing of substance that actually brings glory to the one who created it. It's all about what we keep at the center of our lives, which is why Joshua warns the Israelites in verse 12, as we just read, and we'll read it again, not to intermarry with the Canaanites because that would be clinging to something other than God, putting something else in the center of their lives and binding themselves to a culture that takes their focus off of him and puts it back on themselves. And I understand that may seem unfair to us for God to tell them who they can or cannot marry, but the truth is, the truth is sometimes clinging to God means letting go of other things to make room for him at the center of our lives. Let's keep reading verses 11 through 13. Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God, for if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them so that you associate with them and they with you, Know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you, but they shall be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good ground that the Lord your God has given you. So Joshua offers them a stern warning about clinging to the Canaanite culture around them. He says, don't cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them so that you associate with them or them with you. And I uh, just want to be clear, when Joshua warns against associating with them, he's not saying don't speak to them, don't get near them in any way, treat them like dirt, don't tell them about your God or your way of life, no. First of all, the word associate in verse 12 in the original Hebrew is the word bo, and it means to go into or to enter into. In other words, to associate with in this verse is something much deeper than what we usually think of today when we talk about associating with others. And of course, Joshua is also using that word here in the context of marriage with uh, pagan culture. So uh, we've already seen as well, by the way, God's desire uh, for foreigners, sojourners, to be grafted into the family of God, right, in several places. Rahab, of course, being one great example. So what Joshua is warning them against here is clinging to being bound to these people and their pagan gods and their pagan culture. But there's something else here that's very important, and we don't want to miss it. It's the third point in our outline, and it is, in fact, the whole reason behind all these rules and instructions. Right here in the very heart of Joshua's sermon in verse 11, he says, Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. Okay, keeping... God at the center of your life means loving him, which is so important, in fact, that everything else in this sermon by Joshua, the command to keep the word of God and uh, the commands to avoid being entangled in pagan cultures by clinging to God, all of that is just a means to an end. Right? Sometimes the, uh, the Pentateuch, the, the first five books of the Old Testament and others like Joshua, sometimes they get a bad rap because it can seem like it's all just a bunch of harsh religious rules, right? Lists of do's and don'ts, when in reality, the commands of God for his people to be faithful to him all throughout the Old Testament, they were never given 
in a sterile environment or a harshly overbearing environment. No, they were always given in the service of a much larger principle, a profoundly larger principle, namely the fact that God wants a loving relationship with his people, which he expressly stated in Deuteronomy 6, 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. According to Jesus in Matthew 22, 37, that is the greatest commandment of all of them. In 1 Corinthians 13, 13, the apostle Paul says that faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. The apostle Peter said, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. First Peter 4, 8, you see, love is the common thread that runs throughout God's word because his desire is to have a loving relationship with his people. And so he promised to be with his people in Joshua 1, 9, just as Jesus promised to be with us in Matthew 28, 20. And in return, he wants our loyalty, and most of all, he wants our love. You see, all of this, at the end of the day, it all simply comes down to God loving us and us loving him back. And yet it's not just a feeling. It's not just meant to be something we, we believe in or include as a part of our lives. No, God wants our love focused on him to be at the very center of our lives. Verse 11, when Joshua says, be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. If you read just the part that says, be very careful, therefore, if you read that in the ancient Hebrew, it literally reads, take care for your very souls. So the whole verse reads, take care for your very souls to love the Lord your God. In other words, love the Lord your God for the very sake of your own life. This is for you that I'm giving this command. This is for your benefit, for your life's sake that you love God and keep him at the center of your life. You understand God, he, he desires our love. He doesn't need our love. He doesn't. God isn't improved by our love. He isn't made better when we love him. He isn't dependent upon our love. God isn't lost without our love, and he isn't changed by our love. We, on the other hand, that's a different story altogether. We must love God for the sake of our own lives, because our lives are infinitely improved by loving him. Our lives are dependent upon loving him. We're lost when we do not love him, but when we choose to keep him at the center of our lives with all of our love, focused on him, everything changes in our lives for our immediate and our eternal good which is why we keep his word. It's why we cling to him so that we can love him as we should and as we must for the sake of our very souls. Understand this is the power in choosing to love God back. Blaise Pascal once observed, when God addresses our human hearts, there's always enough light for those who desire to see, yet enough obscurity for those who do not wish to see. What makes the difference is the heart. You understand, God loves us already. The key to keeping him in the center of our lives is not convincing him to love us more. No, the key is rather our response to that love, which means keeping him in the center of our lives. And that only happens when we're very careful, Joshua says, to love him back. You see, sometimes loving God means not being so in love with the world. Because the fact is, there's a throne at the center of every single one of our lives, and whoever or whatever occupies that throne, that is what rules us. 
And God wants that to be him. But he won't force it. Just listen to what Joshua says to the Israelites if they choose not to keep God at the center of their lives. We'll read verse 14 to the end of the chapter. And now I'm about to go the way of all the earth, and you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. But just as all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from off this good land that the Lord your God has given you if you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from off the good land that he's given you. Notice how the choice is left up to them. God says, you can choose to keep me at the center of your life, or you can lose out on everything that could be yours. It's your choice. There's so much more that I have in store for you if you would but choose to keep my word. If you would but choose to cling to me. If you would just choose to love me as I've loved you. And, and by the way, lest we think this is all just Old Testament teaching, Jesus said, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. John 14, 21. So what is it? What is it that is occupying the throne at the center of your life today? Only you can answer that. What influences the decisions you make from day to day? What shapes your life more than anything else? Is it God's word? Or is it a desire to be as comfortable and secure and prosperous as possible? Do you cling to God for acceptance and affirmation and validation and satisfaction? Or do you look for all of that from the culture around you? Ask yourself, what does your heart desire more than anything else? Is it God? Or is it something else? Because I can tell you this. You can take every single thing that this world could ever offer you and at its best, it cannot hold a candle to all that God is offering you today. But that can only be found, make no mistake, that can only be found by keeping God at the center of your life. Let's pray.